1917, the Berwickshire News printed an article called The History of the Apron. In part, the article reads, Those who have looked down on the apron may get an entirely new idea of the subject, reading a few words devoted to its history. The flannel bath apron, the sewing apron with lots of deep pockets, the denim clothes spun apron, and lots of others might be added to this list if further proof is needed that apron wearing is an ancient and honorable habit, almost as old as the history of dress itself. Hi, welcome back. This week I'm going to be making an Edwardian apron from Butterick's Historic Aprons pattern. I'm not gonna lie to you. I did watch all of Lark Rise to Canford and Restart Downton Abbey recently, so I am so deeply enamored with aprons. I've been gone for a while because life comes at you fast and don't stop coming, and now we're here. Though I've been sewing feverishly, I have not had the time, the mental capacity, or the words to actually put together some videos, but I have been making clothing. There's a whole lot more stuff coming your way eventually. And while I've been gone, there have been some very important conversations in the costuming community, especially around costuming with context. And I will refer you once again to the fabulous Muse and Dionysus. They have been on the leading edge of all of this and have been saying some really important things about how when we overlook the frequently dark and colonial and oppressive history that goes along with all of the beauty and the fun of costuming. When we neglect that, then we're missing the entire point of history. That basically, we can't have all of these things that glorify the clothing without also inspecting the culture and the values and the mistakes that they came from and committing to use that information to create a more equitable future. I haven't been great about context in the past because I do not have a background in history or sewing I've been learning all of this as I go along. That doesn't excuse me from understanding the wider context of this. So today we will be learning about aprons. I am fascinated by average working class clothing because in the past I would not be, you know, a fancy person with a dowry. I would definitely be a servant or, you know, might be dead. Aww. Just because of medical care and whatnot. I wasn't able to find many historical references to the apron style that I chose. I found slightly similar aprons, but they were all a little bit more refined. But aprons have a long and distinguished history. At the heart of it, aprons are a sort of protective garment, much like a chemise. Because it was so expensive, time-consuming, and complicated to sew and then to launder garments, it was important to have easy-to-make garments to go above and below to keep them clean and be easily washable. So just like you would have a chemise that's very simple to make, uses not that much fabric and is washed frequently, the apron is sort of the outer counterpart to that. You put it over the more expensive clothing to protect it from the sort of dust and grime you might encounter on a daily basis, cleaning the home as a servant, or you know, just walking around as a lady of leisure. The chemise and the apron layer would be frequently laundered, whereas dresses were more frequently just aired out or brushed, and aprons have certainly made a resurgence with cottagecore. Emblem of the simpler time, holder of pockets. Same with cute ruffles sometimes. So now that you have my extremely messy description of why aprons are incredibly fascinating, let's get into the making of this Edwardian apron. The pattern's fairly simple. For the front section, it's made with a centerpiece that's cut on the fold, two side pieces, a yoke that's also cut on the fold, and two pockets. The back is fairly simple, with two back panels that connect to the sides of the front, a waistband piece that then connects the back pieces, the ties, and the straps. I used a mystery fabric from the thrift store, not the normal cotton or linen that would be used on an apron like this. Although I have done no instruction reading, I'm gonna try and put all this together today because my supervisor said to do so. And who can say no to that little face? I stitched, flipped, and pressed the apron straps. Then I pressed up the bottom pieces of what would end up being the waistband back piece. I also added an interfacing substitute, which ended up being not necessary because the fabric was so thick. I stitched the top of the pockets and pressed up the bottom edge. 
I then pin together the center front piece and the two side front pieces. They'll be stitched along the curves. And the back pieces will attach at the sides. I then prepared the longer waistband pieces by folding them in half and then stitching around the outside, leaving one end open to flip them. And the back pieces were cut on the selvage, so all I had to do was fold it over once and stitch it down, but you could also fold it over twice if it was a raw edge. I stitched, flipped, and pressed the apron ties as well and gave a press to the stitched up back panel. I had a very limited amount of fabric, so I could not fit the yoke on what I have left. So since piecing was period, I sewed together my remainders and pieced what I could for the yoke out of that. Then I basted the pockets into place on the side panels, starting with the bottom folded up edge and then doing the sides. I set the pocket by pinning it in place, and then I unpinned the top to make sure that I was able to stitch the folded up bottom part of the pocket into place first before basting the sides into place. And as you saw before, I've already finished the very top of the pocket, so that doesn't need to be stitched at all at this point. It's even along the bottom, but the top is a bit wider on the pocket than it is on the piece, so there's a little bit of a gap at the top for you to put things in and out of the pocket. With the center and side front pieces sewn together, I can now pin in place the apron straps and then sandwich them between the yokes, right sides together. It'll be stitched all the way around the top and then be able to be flipped so that the end of the straps is encased within the yoke and the front. This is what it looks like after it's been stitched and I can go ahead and clip the curves and then flip it inside out and prepare it to be top stitched into place. You've gotta, gotta be on the project. Next, I attach the short waistband piece to the back panel and sewed across the top, having already pressed up the front and the side. Then I sandwiched the raw edge of the waist tie into the waistband piece, making sure that the folded edges stayed folded in place. That way, when it's flipped out, all of the raw edges are encased and it gives a really clean appearance. But first, I stitched the waistband piece in place before pinning everything for the waist tie. It's important that the bottom pieces of the waistband are folded up so the edge will be finished when it's flipped out. Then you sew along the edge of the waistband as close as you can possibly get to the back panel. By stitching very close to the edge, it'll make a nice, clean, continuous line up from the back. Once everything's stitched, you can trim down the seam allowance and then flip everything right sides out. And press. You'll finish this by whipping the edge down or doing the stitch in the ditch method, but first you'll need to place the apron strap and sew that to the seam allowance. I measured how long I would need the straps to be before doing this part. I stitched the raw edge of the strap into the seam allowance, trimmed it all down, folded it inside, and then whipped over the edge. Then it was time to sew the back panels on to the side pieces. I pinned it all into place and then ran it through the sewing machine. To finish off the very top edge of the waistband, you need to sandwich it in between the very final edge of the yoke so that everything is covered when you stitch across. 
So basically you fold the edge of the yoke over the very top of the waistband and then when you sew down that seam, you'll be able to flip it out and it'll be smooth and connected across the top. With everything pinned in place, I took a moment to marvel at my very nearly finished garment. Though I use the sewing machine for speed and strength on construction seams, I do like to have a meditative moment of hand sewing on every project. So I finished whipping the waistband in place by hand. Of course, this couldn't be completed without sustenance. Thanks, Mom. Feel mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With that done, all that was left was to finish off with a nice rolled hem. In the article, Servants, Housewives, Vixens, and the Ever-Changing Apron, Catherine Barnley says, the apron was particularly important prior to the 20th century because of the labor involved in laundering clothes. Since the majority of North American households did not have running water in 1890, hot water for laundry needed to be brought in from outdoors and heated on the wood stove, and clothing had to be scrubbed by hand. Laundry soap was made by shaving pieces of homemade lye soap which was caustic to the hands. Even with a washboard, the ridges which helped the users force laundry soap through the cloth, washing clothes, required vigorous scrubbing and a sustained effort to achieve good results. Clearly, it was easier to wash an apron, which was made out of a small amount of utilitarian fabric, than it was to wash a dress of the same period. The apron was less valuable than the dress since the apron was easier to make, whereas dressmaking required a high skill level and large amounts of fabric. As a costume designer, I estimate that the typical dress would have required 7 meters of fancy fabric like velvet or brocade, whereas an apron would have used only 2.5 meters of less expensive utilitarian fabric like cotton or linen. Because of the rigors of the laundry process, dresses tended to be aired out or brushed rather than washed frequently, if they were washed at all. The more expendable apron formed a barrier between the valuable dress and the wet, soapy, dirty laundry process. I found my research into aprons truly fascinating, so if you'd like to learn more, leave a comment and let me know and I might make a video going more into depth about different apron styles and how they were used. And I certainly will be making a few more because the cottagecore vibes are real. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, give it a like and subscribe, and consider sharing this channel with anyone you think would like it as well. Thanks for watching, and in the meantime, keep making.